So welcome to part two of lecture four, where we will discuss the vector formulation for path propagation. So far, we've been treating each of the neurons as an individual comp computational element and each weight as a separate scalar value. For layered networks, it's generally just simpler to think of the process in terms of vector operations. The arithmetic is simpler, and we can take advantage of fast matrix libraries and GPUs to speed up the computation a whole lot. What this means uh, is that we can restate the forward and backward processes in terms of vector operations. And in fact, this is what any real system implements. So let's see how this can be done. When we have a layered network, we can represent the variables associated with the layers as vectors and the weights and biases as matrices. We'll assume a column vector notation throughout. So unless I explicitly state otherwise, vectors are column vectors. We can represent the output values of all of the neurons in a layer, in the, in the kth layer as a vector yk, where the jth element of the vector is simply the output of the jth neuron in the layer. Similarly, I can represent the affine values at the input to the kth layer as a vector zk, where the jth entry in the vector is simply the affine value at the jth neuron. We can represent all of the weights of the connections coming into the layer as a matrix. The any uh, row in the matrix represents the set of all weights coming in to the corresponding neuron in the layer. So for example, this first layer represents the set of all weights coming in to the first neuron. The second layer represents the set of all weights coming into the second neuron and so on. And so also we can represent all the biases at all of these neurons as a vector BK. And once we have uh, defined everything in this manner, then we can actually write out the uh, computation. Having defined all of our uh, vectors, the yk vectors, which are the which is the vector of outputs of the kth layer, and the zk vectors, which is the vector of affine values of the kth layer, and the weights matrix and the bias matrix. In terms of these variables, we can simply write the affine values at the kth layer simply as zk equals wk times yk minus one plus bk. And you can verify that this arithmetic works. Let me clear my screen first. Ah, clear, clear, clear canvas. So consider this. We have uh, in the scalar notation, how did we represent the uh, ith, the uh, ith affine value in the kth layer? This was simply the summation over all the neurons in the previous layer of the weight of the connection from the neuron to the ith neuron of the kth layer times the output of the uh, jth neuron in the k minus one layer plus of course the bias. So this was your standard scalar notation. The affine value at any neuron was the weighted sum of all of the of the outputs of all the neurons in the previous layer. So that's this k minus one plus the bias. Now let's see how this, uh, when we, when we uh, write this in, in uh, vector notation, this is what we had. We said zk equals wk times yk minus one plus bk. Let's write this out. So consider the first entry of zk. This is going to be the product of the first row of WK, which is W11K, W21K, W31K, and so on, and the vectors in the K minus the of the uh, uh, 
vector of outputs from the k minus one layer plus of course the bias term which is going off my screen now let's expand this out and if you expand it out you're going to get z i uh, z say 1k is going to be w11 k times y1 k minus 1 plus w21 k times y2 k minus 1 and so on plus the bias term which is off the screen which is going to be b1 of k and so if you compare this equation to what we had in the scalar format, you're going to see that the two are the same. So we can verify that this equation indeed does compute the correct affine values at the kth layer. And to compute the output of the neurons in the kth layer, we just put these affine values through the activation function for the kth layer, and we get the output of the uh, kth layer. So uh, having vectorized everything in this manner, now here is the vectorized version of the forward pass. As an initialization, we first set the uh, zeroth layer value y0 to the input. This is just initialization. Then we compute the affine vector at the first layer as the as, uh, using this affine equation, which is the weight matrix for the first layer times the output vector for the previous layer plus the bias of the first layer. And then uh, once we compute the affine values, we just put these affine values through the uh, activation function for the first layer to get the output of the first layer. By the way, you're going to see an equation expanding out at the bottom. Ignore it, this is merely meant to explain to you, if you, go, if you look at it carefully, that the neural network is in fact just a nested function. Uh, this is somewhat of an aside, Let's just focus on what's happening over here. So we see how we can compute the output of the first layer. Then we can compute the affine value at the second layer, W2 times Y1 plus B2. The weight matrix for the second layer times the output of the first layer plus the bias for the second, second layer. And then we can compute the output for the second layer by simply applying the activation function for the second layer to the affine vector over here. And we can continue to perform this, these computations going left to right until we uh, eventually get affine combination at the output layer to which we will finally apply our final output layer activation to get the network output. Now observe that when we write things in this manner, we are speaking of applying, regardless of the layer, we are speaking of applying an activation function to a vector and obtaining a vector. So this entire, this representation is kind of agnostic to whether these activation functions are scalar, act uh, just a collection of scalar activations, like applying, uh, uh, individual reloose to every layer, or if it is a vector activation like a softmax. As far as the uh, uh, mathematical representation goes, it does not change. So the entire forward pass simplifies to this. You initialize the zeroth layer value as the input, then you iterate through the layers. At each layer, you first compute the affine vector, zk, through the simple affine relationship, the weight for the layer times the output of the previous layer plus the bias. And then you compute the output of the layer simply by applying the layer activation to the affine vector. The output of the entire network itself is simply the output of the final layer. So here is the pseudocode for the forward, forward pass in vector form. We initialize y0, then we iterate through the layers, and we iterate through the layers, and at each layer, we first compute the affine vector using this formula, and then you pass the affine vector through the activation function for the layer to get the output of the layer, 
and the output of the network itself is simply the output of the final layer. And you can see that this uh, vectorized form of the forward pass is much cleaner and much simpler than the uh, forward computation we had when we were thinking of it in terms of performing the computations for each neuron separately when we were doing it in the scalar format. And now that we have seen how to perform the forward pass in uh, vector notation, let's see how we can do the backward pass. But before we do that, we're going to look at some vector calculus. And even before that, I want to uh, mention an important fact. Anytime you have a scalar function of some vector variable, so D is a scalar and Z is a vector, say Z is a R cross one column vector, then the derivative of Z with D with respect to Z is going to be a one cross R column vector. You've already seen this. Uh, this rule generalizes. If you have a scalar function of a matrix where the matrix is say L cross M, then the derivative of D with respect to the matrix is going to be the transient shape and size as the transpose of W, it is going to be M cross L. So in general, when you have a scalar function and it is a function of some object, a vector or a um, matrix, the derivative of the scalar with respect to its argument is going to be the same size as the transpose of the argument. And uh, this can be easily shown, but we're going to use this property to derive our vector calculus. So first, what is a derivative? Remember this, a derivative is a multiplicative factor that multiplies a perturbation in the input to compute the corresponding perturbation of the output. Uh, we've seen this earlier. So if I have some function y equals f of z, then the derivative of y with respect to z is this term, which multiplies delta z to give you the corresponding delta y. Now this rule is generic. It holds regardless of whether these arguments are scalars, vectors, or maybe scalars or vectors. So uh, now, or in fact, even matrices, but there it gets a little complicated. Anyway, so in the uh, case of scalar functions of vector arguments, We've already seen that delta y equals derivative sometimes delta z holds. And so if z is a r cross one vector, this derivative is a one cross r rho vector. And the transpose of the derivative we saw was called the gradient of y with respect to z. Now, if you have a vector function of a vector argument, so now y is a column vector, say an m component vector, and z is also a vector, say a d component column vector, then too this property holds. Delta y is going to be the derivative of y with respect to z times delta z. And immediately you can see how the dimensions fit. Delta z is going to be, uh, this one is going to be uh, d cross one. Delta y is going to be m cross one. So clearly to make this fit, this derivative has to be m cross t. So the size of the derivative is going to have, it's going to have as many rows as y, and it's going to have as many columns as the number of rows of z. This, this derivative, when y and z are both, are both vectors, then this derivative is called a Jacobian. Now, a little more on this. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Jacobian specifically has this form. The way to think about the Jacobian is to say that each row of the Jacobian is the derivative of one component, component of y with respect to the vector z. And so from that, it follows that the Jacobian is going to have as many rows as the components of y. And furthermore, because the derivative of any y 
any component of y with respect to z is simply the row where the row of partial derivatives of the corresponding y with respect to these z's. So each row of the Jacobian matrix is going to have, is going to be a row of the partial derivatives of the corresponding y with respect to the entries of z. So that is the Jacobian man, Jacobian. And now, uh, when you think of neural networks, for a neural network, let's say you have scalar activations in a layer. That means that you have uh, uh, each neuron operates on a single affine term to compute its output. So each neuron operates on just one single affine term to compute its output. And so uh, this means that the derivative of this output with respect to the corresponding affine term is going to be non-zero, but the derivative is going to be zero for all of the remaining terms, remaining affine terms. As a result, the Jacobian matrix is going to be a diagonal matrix where the off-diagonal entries representing the derivative of, of the y's with respect to the remaining z's are zero, and the diagonal entries themselves are the derivatives of the activation function for each z. So this is for when you have a scalar activation function. Uh, when you have a vector activation function, then the Jacobian matrix is going to be a full matrix where each row is going to be a row of partial derivatives of the y with, with respect to the corresponding z. Now, there's one more special case, affine functions. So let's say you have z equals w y plus z plus b. I've written this as z of y to indicate that z is actually a function of y. But then over here, it's very easy for us to verify, right? z is a, uh, z equals w y plus b. So if I increment y, then z will increment. So z plus delta z is going to be w times y plus delta y plus b, which gives us delta z equals w times delta y. So in other words, the derivative of z with respect to y is simply going to be this matrix W. And using the same logic, if I increment B rather than Y, then Z plus delta Z is going to be WY plus B plus delta B, which tells me that delta Z equals delta B which tells me that the derivative of z with respect to b is simply the identity matrix. And so for this affine function over here, the derivative of z with respect to y, which is the Jacobian of z with respect to y, observe the notation here, by the way. Uh, the notation I'm using for the Jacobian is somewhat inverted with respect to this inverse triangle notation. This is to indicate that this is actually a function of the specific position at which the derivative is being computed. So the derivative of z, which is in the subscript, which is with respect to y, which is in the argument. Anyway, the Jacobian of z with respect to y over here is simply going to be dubbed in, and the Jacobian of z with respect to b is going to be the identity matrix. Now, uh, let's consider the chain rule. In general, if you have a nested function, y equals uh, some y of z of x, where y may be a scalar, z may be a scalar or a vector, x may be a scalar of that for a vector, then what is the derivative of y with respect to x? The chain rule states that the derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative of y with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to x. Note the order over here. So the derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative of y with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to x. And observe that the, uh, that 
the the chain rule goes outside in in this next state function so the first term is the derivative of the outermost function with respect to its argument the second term is the derivative of the inner function with respect to its argument so the chain rule always goes uh, outside n now we can verify this so uh, i can write let me write this on a whiteboard i have y equals y of z of x so i can write this as y equals y of z and z equals z of x then using our derivative rule delta y is going to be the derivative of y with respect to z times delta z and similarly uh, delta z is going to be the derivative of z with respect to x times delta x so replacing this guy here you're going to get delta y equals delta z, the derivative of y with respect to z times the this is the inverse triangle times the derivative of z with respect to x times delta x and so uh, now remember the derivative formula the derivative of y with respect to x was this term uh, nabla y x times delta x and so comparing these two you can see that the derivative of y with respect to x is simply the product of the derivative of y with respect to z and the derivative of z with respect to x so uh, arithmetically you can show you can verify that this this chain rule relationship holds but then there's another way of verifying it and you can verify it via the dimensions of the variables they must match so let's do this for two special cases first consider the case where uh, all the variables are vectors so y is uh, is a is a vector z is a vector and x is a vector now uh, let x be a vector of say dimension m right and uh, let's now let, so let z the output of z of x be a vector of dimension m then and let y be a vector of dimension m then z and x are vectors so the derivative of z, okay first let's consider the relationship between direct relationship between y and x using the rule that we saw earlier the derivative of y with respect to x might must be an n cross l matrix but then z and x are vectors so the derivative of z with respect to x this one this term is an m cross l matrix and the derivative of y with respect to z where y and z are vectors this term is going to be an n cross m matrix and so the product of the two is going to give you an n cross l matrix which is the correct size is this that so so when you have a vector function of a vector function of a vector argument then this relationship holds in dimension wise too now let's consider a simpler case where you have a scalar function d is a scalar y is a vector and z is a vector now here too uh, again the chain rule says that the derivative of d with respect to z is the derivative of d with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to z so again observe how the chain rule goes it sort of goes in from outside first you compute this derivative and then you right multiply that by the by this derivative and now let's verify the sizes so again if z is say size l and y is say size m this is a scalar size m then we know from our derivative rules that the derivative of d with respect to uh, z must be a one cross l vector but because y and z are derivatives this guy this jaco uh, are vectors this jacobian must be size m cross l and 
since y is a vector, the derivative of d with respect to y is going to be the same size as the transpose of y. This is going to be one cross m. So this is one cross m. So this product is one cross l, which is the size that we want. And so uh, even in this case, we can verify that the dimensions match. Now, finally, consider the special case where you have some scalar d is a function of some vector n is z, and z in turn is an affine function of y. It's w y plus b. Now, the derivative of d with respect to y is going to be the derivative of d with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to y. This is the chain rule. But then we know from this from this from this term over here that the derivative of z with respect to y is just w. So from here we end up with this equation: the derivative of d with respect to derivative of d with respect to y is the derivative of d with respect to z times w. Now similarly, the derivative of d with respect to b is going to be the derivative of d with respect to z times the derivatives of z with respect to b, but this, because of the relationship z equals w y plus b, this is going to be just the identity matrix. And so we end up with this relationship, the derivative of d with respect to b is simply going to be the derivative of d with respect to z itself. And this last one is uh, the most interesting. The derivative of d with respect to w is actually going to be uh, y times, so this is, let me try, this is simply going to be y times the derivative of d with respect to z. So this term which came second over here comes first and the derivative of d with respect to z comes second. Now the proof of this is not hard. It's, it's quite trivial to derive this using the chain rule, but it requires mul multiple transpositions. I won't do it in class, but it is on the next slide. And so I suggest you look up the slides. But then let's verify the dimensions, right? So uh, uh, z is an affine, fun affine function of y. Let's say uh, y is an L cross one vector and let's say z is n cross one. Now this implies that w is n cross l, right? And so this implies in turn that the derivative of d with respect to w must be the same size as the transpose of w. This must be l cross n. Now let's see if the dimensions fit. Y we said was l cross one, right? Now the derivative of d, d is a scalar, z is n cross one. So the derivative of d with respect to z is going to be one cross n, is the trans same size as the transpose of z. And so when you multiply these two, an l cross one vector, multiplying a, one, a column vector, multiplying a one cross n row vector is going to give you an l cross n matrix, which is the same size as the transpose of w which works. And so uh, the dimensions fit. Now, we've gone through our calculus lesson. So let's return to the backward pass. After, after computing the forward pass, we will have the network output one. From it, we can consider the desired output, which is going to be the same size as y, and we compute the divergence. Now we must go backward through the net and compute the derivatives of the divergence with respect to, uh, to with respect to all the intermediate variables and all of the network parameters. Now in the following slides, I'm going to be using this notation consistently. So, which is the, the inverted triangle of the Nabla notation. So in general derivative y z is going to be the derivative of y with respect to z, derivative divergence, y is going to be the derivative of divergence with respect to y, derivative divergence, uh, z is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z, uh, and so on, right? 
So this is the, uh, the, the variable, and this is the argument that you're taking the derivative with. And I will use this notation regardless of whether these are scalars or vectors, because the notation is generic. But where necessary, I will change it to, the, to a more standard notation. Now, first, we are going to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of the network. If the output of the network is an L component vector, then this divergence is going to be a one cross L rho vector. Now, uh, the divergence is a function of the output y. You know, we've, we've got the divergence is basically a function of the output y, and y in turn is a function of the affine input z. So using the chain rule, the derivative of the divergence with respect to the affine input is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to z. And the derivative of y with respect to z, of course, this guy is just the Jacobian of the activation function. And so, uh, the derivative of the divergence with respect to z is the derivative of the divergence with respect to y times the Jacobian of this activation function. And again, if y is an L cross one vector, then z is going to be an L cross one vector. So the derivative of divergence, this guy is a one cross L vector. If z is an L cross one vector, you want this to be one cross L. Now the input and output of this activation function are both size L. So we know this Jacobian is L cross L. You can see that the, you can see that the dimensions fit. And, now, and so over here again, the derivative of the divergence with respect to y, this term here, was already computed. This Jacobian is the new term that you're multiplying. Uh, I'm sort of, I've sort of messed up things over here so that it erase uh, things a bit. And so what you see is this, this term here was already computed in the backward pass. This Jacobian is the new term that you're going to right multiply the existing derivative web to get the derivative with respect to the affine term out here. And the new term, is right multiplying the existing term. Observe that the new terms will always right multiply. Now we can take a step back from here to here. Now the divergence is a nested function. So the di if the divergence is the divergence depends directly on z. So the divergence is a function of z, zn, which is the affine term at the output layer. Zn in turn is a function of the output of the previous layer. And so using the chain rule, the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of the previous layer of yn minus one is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to zn times the derivative of zn with respect to yn minus one. And zn, the relationship between zn and yn minus one, of course, is the one given here. And so Zn is an affine function of Yn minus one, which means that the derivative of Zn with Zn with respect to Yn minus one is simply going to be the weights matrix for the output layer. So replacing this term here, we are going to get that the derivative of the divergence with respect to the, the, the output of the N minus one layer is the derivative of the divergence with respect to Zn, the affine term at the output layer, times the weight matrix of the output layer. So divergence, derivative of divergence with respect to Yn minus one is simply the derivative of that, the divergence with respect to Zn, right multiplied. Can you, this is, so this term, we already had this term coming back. So this is the new term that's getting factored in and this new term is right multiplying the existing derivative. And, and so uh, now we can take a further step back. Recall, uh, remember that we had a few slides ago, uh, we had this 
uh, we when you had a function of this kind the derivative you know d is a scalar function of z which is an affine function of w then we got these two rules for the derivative of d with respect to w and the derivative of d with respect to b the derivative of d with respect to b was simply the derivative of d with respect to z the derivative of d with respect to w was y times the derivative of d with respect to z so we saw this a few slides ago and so we will apply that here so these were the two rules we saw and just applying this rule over here uh, we have we can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to one to the weights wn this term here the derivative of the divergence with respect to the weights is going to be by n minus 1 which is the output of this layer times the derivative of the divergence with respect to zn so watch carefully again it's following exactly the rules over here the divergence is a function of z z is an affine function of z is an affine function of y so the derivative of the divergence with respect to w is y times the derivative of the divergence with respect to z and uh, uh, you can uh, verify the sizes again uh, so the, if uh, say this if there are say uh, uh, some l neurons over here so so if the n minus 1 layer is of size l and if the nth layer is of size d then the weight matrix is going to be d cross f right because it's going from an l component vector to a d component vector now so this is it no this is l cross one and this guy the derivative of the divergence with respect to a d component vector is one cross d so this product is going to be l cross d which is the transpose of the weight matrix. So the, so the, so the size is over here. Match. Now, using the same rules as before, the derivative of the divergence with respect to the bias is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z. So, uh, so in the process of going back, we can also compute erasing, let me erase all the nonsense and uh, clean up the derivative of the uh, divergence with respect to w so the derivative of the divergence with respect to wn is going to be yn minus 1 times the derivative of the divergence with respect to Zn, which is this equation here, and the derivative of the divergence with respect to Bn is going to simply be the derivative of the divergence with respect to Zn. So, uh, in going backwards, now what we have done is we've gone back, we've computed the derivative with respect to y, with respect to z, to these parameters, and also the output of this layer with respect to y n minus 1. Now we can take a step back and compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to z n minus 1 the affine term at the n minus 1th layer and again using the chain rule this is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to y n minus 1 right multiplied by the derivative of y n minus 1 with respect to z n minus 1 this first term was already computed going back so this is the new term that we are factoring in and this new term to the right is simply the Jacobian of the activation function, the Jacobian of the activation function in this layer, right? because we are at the n minus one layer. And if you have scalar activations, this Jacobian is, is going to be a diagonal matrix. And now continuing on, we can take a step back and compute the derivative for the output of the n minus two at layer which is simply going to be using the chain rule, the derivative of the divergence with respect to z 
n minus 1, this one, times the derivative of z n minus 1 with respect to y n minus 2. This term was already computed going back. And what is this term? Again, remember that z n minus 1 equals the weight matrix for the n minus 1 layer times the output of the n minus 2 layer. So this second term is simply going to be the weight matrix for the n minus 1 layer. And so factoring that in, the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of this layer is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to Zn right multiplied by this weight matrix. And in the process, again, using the same rules as before, we can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the parameters of this layer. The derivative for the weights is going to be y, yn minus 1 times the derivative for zn minus 1. And the derivative for the bias is simply going to be the derivative for zn minus 1. And now we can go back from there because now we have the derivatives for the output of this layer. We can go back and compute the derivatives for the affine inputs and then everything preceding it. And you can keep going back in this manner until eventually we work our way to obtain the derivatives with respect to the affine vector for the first layer, which is simply going to be uh, the, the derivative for the output of the first layer times the Jacobian for the activation function of the first layer. And we can also go back and compute the derivatives for the parameters of the first layer going backwards. So here is the pseudocode for the backward pass. We first compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output. Now this is a bit of magic because itself and uh, it's not a part of the network. It depends on the definition of the divergence. From there on, we can just loop back simply. You loop back through the layers. So you, you loop back through the layers and at each layer, you first compute the Jacobian for the uh, activation of the, of the layer. Then you get the derivative for the affine input to the layer by, by right multiplying the derivative of the output by the Jacobian. Then you take a step back and compute the derivative for the output of the previous layer by right multiplying this term, which you just computed by the weight matrix for the layer. And then along the way, we also uh, compute the derivative for the weights of the layer as the output of the previous layer times the derivative for the uh, affine term at the layer. And you get the derivative for the bias as the derivative for the derivative for z itself. Now again, uh, so this is the uh, entire training algorithm. Let's see. Uh, this is the entire training algorithm. We're going to initialize all the weights and biases. Then for each training instance, you're going to perform the forward pass and compute the output using the vector formalism. Then having computed the output, you can compute the divergence and the loss and, the, and, the, and increment the loss with this divergence. Then you can work your way back using the rules that we just saw and you can uh, compute the derivatives for all of the parameters of the network for that particular input. These derivatives, of course, get accumulated over all of the uh, training instances, so they're getting accumulated. And then finally, in, or, in order to update your parameters, you're just going to use the gradient descent rule. This one over t term over here is dividing by the total number of training instances to make sure that the derivative is properly normalized.
and so uh, so uh, uh, now that we've seen how to perform the forward and backward computations and how to compute derivatives for the divergence with respect to all the parameters and how to incorporate them into gradient descent based learning uh, let's see how we can actually set up for uh, digit recognition here's the overall process for a typical problem uh, say uh, we want to recognize if a digit represents the digit p image represents the digit zero or, or a digit two or not we're going to have a collection of training instances and for each training instance we are going to have a label which tells you which, which, will, which will be zero if it's not a two a one if it's a two and so our uh, target output is binary we will set up our network with a single output with a with a sigmoid activation we're going to use callback libler divergence and then we'll use back propagation to compute the derivatives for all of these training instances for, for, for all of these training instances and uh, finally update the uh, network parameters with the average derivative over all training instances and we will keep updating this iterating this process till the loss converges now if you have uh, a more complex problem where we have to determine which digit the Im image represents now our network will have 10 outputs uh, uh, which represents which digit each each uh, which is representing the 10 digits uh, and then uh, the output layer of the network is going to have be a soft match so these outputs are going to be the probabilities of the digits our training data itself will have labels of this kind where for each training instance we'll have a label indicating which digit it is which is, which is the class now uh, for actual training we are going to be re representing these using one hot representations and then we can compute a divergence between the output and the uh, one hot representations for these labels and now to train the network we do a forward pass through over all of the training instances compute the divergences do a backward pass compute all the derivatives aggregate the derivatives uh, backward pass using back propagation to compute the derivatives in a problem like this the divergence is, that you use with itself will typically be the KL divergence and then once you've computed the derivatives for all the training instances you will use the average of all of these derivatives in your gradient descent algorithm to update the parameters and so the story so far neural networks must be trained to minimize the average divergence between the output of the network and the desired output over a set of training instances. We will usually perform minimization through gradient descent. The gradients of the divergence for any individual training instance with respect to network parameters can be computed using backpropagation. Backpropagation in turn requires a forward pass of inference to compute all intermediate variables and the output and a backward pass of gradient computation and the computed gradients can now be incorporated into gradient descent and so and so uh, uh, we have uh, sort of laid out how the entire training formalism works with back propagation the next thing we will have to consider is how well does it work does this entire uh, you know, we've actually used, we haven't trained using backpropagation. You must be clear. We are training using gradient descent. We are using backpropagation to compute the gradients. So the real issue we are asking is how well does this gradient descent perform? Does it converge to the correct, correct solution? Uh, or does it, or is the correct solution for gradient descent the one we actually want? Turns out that is actually a question to be asked. And when it does find the solution, how quickly does it get there and can we improve it? And since we are talking about a loss, which is designed to defined only over the training and the set of training instances, will the uh, network that we learn to fit the input output relations for these training instances generalize to data outside the training set? And 
what does this output really mean? I mean, all of these intermediate variables and the output of the network, how do we interpret it? We will look at all of these questions in the, uh, in the uh, next few classes. So that is the end of part two of lecture four. Thank you for listening.